Here we are. And people are joining us. I will give them a couple of minutes while they come and we are getting ready. You can hear me fine and you can see me. A bit yellowish, eh? So good morning to the Americas. Good afternoon or good evening uh, to Europe and uh, beyond. And maybe we have uh, some people joining us uh, from the eastern part of, of from where we are located, which means that it's late night for them. Uh, this is a webinar that gave us a bit of headache uh, when we were trying to choose the right title to convey the message. I think. We have a good enough title to work with. It's going to be about uh, how we see uh, digital food safety changing organizations at the, at the end of the day. That's the essence of what we wanted to, to talk about. And why are we talking about this kind of change? Well, essentially it's because the world is changing. It has been changing, it's changing nowadays, and it most probably will continue to change in different ways. And this is having a tremendous effect uh, in, in companies that operate in the supply chain, either because they have to work with restricted budgets and be under continuous improvements, reorganizations or changes within the structure. Or, and because the way that people work is not the same, the habits that we are following, the remote or hybrid ways of working, or the way that people view uh, work and how long they stay in, the, in an organization. This is changing nowadays. Food safety compliance is becoming more digital, and this is changing the content and the responsibilities and uh, the outcome that people have to deliver, then safety adds up with sustainability concerns and requirements coming either from the consumers or and or from the standards and specifications that companies apply. And while this is happening, the world is being hard, hit hard by uh various disruptions and this means that unusual or unexpected or forgotten risks hit the supply chain i think that this becomes an efficiency question and this is what uh digital transformation is all about and this puts a difficult question on the table for people in uh, organizations what do we do do we develop digital capabilities? Do we transform the way that we do business or do we wait? And if we do transform the way that we do business, do we do it internally? Are we looking for people and new types of roles taking over new types of activities within the organization or do we rely upon what vendors are giving us and get the support from external specialists? And when do we start doing something like this? Are we proactive, moving fast so that we can catch up with change or do we wait to see what others are doing? So that's exactly what we had in mind for this webinar. And we designed it to share a bit of experience, ideas, or even challenges that have questions that we haven't answered yet with uh, people in large organizations that are either starting or have already started this journey. The obvious question that we used was, where do I start from? Or where am I in the journey? But I think what's hidden behind the, the, the official uh, wording of the topics is also how can we manage to suffer less? How can our people suffer less from this change management uh, process? 
Ideally, I would hope that at the end of the webinar, all participants, as included, come out with a better understanding of which are the options ahead at the different steps or stages of the journey. Maybe gain a better understanding of the different ways that, that you can follow, the different paths that one can follow when choosing how to implement such a transformative journey and share a bit of good practice, what has been working for people and a bit of not so good practice, traps that have caused uh, money and energy and uh, in some cases uh, sleep uh, to people so that we can all live wiser at the end of this one hour. The speakers, I think, are the perfect ones for this kind of conversation. Uh, I have with us uh, Yanis, who is day every day from the morning till late at night working and supporting clients on exactly this kind of questions and suffering from these challenges that he will be describing and hopefully he will share a bit of experience on how he sees these challenges being overcome and Colin who was working and having this kind of systems view responsibility deploying a digital platform in a global organization with different roles being involved, with different people being involved, with different geographies and culture being involved. And he has been through this painful digital transformation journey and he has done it and he's eager to share what has worked and what has not worked so well. So let's get it started. Yanis, I'm handing over control, mission control, and the floor to you. Thank you so much, Nikos. I don't know why, but it was quite hard to find that mute button, but okay, I, I, will, I will manage it. So thank you so much, and it's always a pleasure, and I'm very happy if we can share some of the knowledge that we see horizontally from uh, the industry. Uh, so I will try to share some of this knowledge, highlighting uh, both the challenges, but also the opportunities, uh, and I will mainly share the, the experience that has to do with uh, the deployment of a risk intelligence solution. So first of all, what we see, and I think that we will all agree on that, is that digital, the digital food safety landscape is changing, both in terms of the practices, the best practices, but also in terms of the requirements that are coming from the legislation. So I, I have here the example of uh, the FDA's uh, blueprint for the new era of smarter food safety, uh, where there are many interesting uh, points and uh, there are already some new regulations like the one, uh, the proposed rule for the food traceability, uh, but also uh, other uh, rules that have been already established, which require the adoption of uh, digital solutions. Uh, and. Uh, it's obvious now that uh, doing this, starting this journey of digital transformation for the food safety uh, is something that uh, is, is the option if you want to, to improve the risk prevention approaches that you have in place. So first of all, I would like to share what we see from the leaders uh, in, the, in the food industry on how they embark to a digital food safety journey. So we, we see three scenarios. The one scenario has to do with uh, doing a huge investment in digital uh, R&D to explore new technologies, offerings, uh, and to see which is the business value of these uh, technologies. The second thing that we see is that 
there are leaders that are uh, selecting a specific portfolio or a suite of uh, external uh, providers and solutions that fit into the way uh, that uh, the things are being done internally in the company. And the third uh, way that we, in which we see that the leaders are embarking the digital food safety journey is by letting the teams be more autonomous and use digital tools that uh, can automate critical tasks uh, and uh, they can add immediate values. Uh, I would like to, uh, to put here the angle of the risk analysis, and I would like to share with you which are the risks that we see uh, in these three ways of uh, starting the journey, the digital, uh, the digitization journey. So the first thing that we see in the case of doing a huge investment in, uh, in digital R&D is that there is a risk of letting uh, the data science, uh, the, the data scientists driving the food uh, safety organization. So the, this is something that we see. The second thing in, in the case of uh, selecting external providers and uh, solutions that are ready and that you can uh, directly adopt is that uh, we see the risk of assigning it to internal leaders or uh, project managers and uh, falling into cracks and have single point of failure in some, in some cases. And in the third way of uh, embarking this uh, journey, we see where, where we have this more uh, distributed and autonomous, uh, autonomous way of uh, using the digital tools is that uh, there is a risk of being disconnected from the strategy of the company, from the wider strategy. So I would like to, to go into more detail and share some specific cases uh, of how, uh, which are the options of deploying uh, a digital uh, food safety solution, a risk intelligence solution. And uh, I have here the three use cases that I would like to share. The first one uh, is a more top-down approach uh, that we see that the companies uh, can follow. Uh, so this is uh, this has to do with deploying a risk intelligence solution in centrally uh, at the at the corporates at the headquarter level. The second uh, scenario, deployment scenario that we see in the industry, it's uh, it has is a more bottom up. Uh, so we have the deployment of the solution at different levels of the supply chain, and uh, mainly involving the key stakeholders. Uh, at a global level, but also at a regional level. And the third one is a combination of the, the two ones, is, is using, is combining uh, aspects from uh, the top down and the bottom up uh, approach, deployment approach, uh, is something that we call, called a hybrid uh, approach. And uh, in this approach, we have top, top level risk monitoring, but also uh, we have uh, key suppliers and manufacturing partners which are adopting uh, the solution uh, that the company has uh, selected and is deploying. Let's go to uh, some more detail uh, of uh, these specific scenarios. So starting from the first scenario, which as I mentioned, it's a top-down scenario. The purpose here is to have a uh, uh, headquarter-driven transformation of the way that risks are being monitored, assessed, and communicated. So the goal is to provide to the to mainly to the global food safety team the information about food safety risks, uh, and uh, this information can help them uh, to take decisions about the mitigation actions uh, and to create mitigation plans and to have to activate the actions. And so the, this is the, the case of the top-down approach that we see. Uh, in a, putting this into a more visual way, a more visual format, uh, usually there are already a lot of data, internal data that are used uh, in order to do the risk assessment. This can be data that has to do with audits, with lab tests, 
uh, but also supplier data, uh, other data for that the company is using for risk assessment. Uh, but uh, one thing that uh, the company wants to introduce in this scenario is the view of the external risks. Uh, so in, in this case, they are trying to combine all this uh, risk information and to put uh, the risk information in a central uh, risk storage. This can be a file or it can be even a database. Before putting the information in a central place, the, the risk information in a central place, we have also food safety and uh, quality assurance experts which are assessing the, the data and the risks that, uh, that we have, that they are collecting, both the external but also the internal ones. So the main goal in this case is uh, this, the, the validated risks uh, to show them through a dashboard, through, uh, through a dashboard that the company is building uh, and uh, help the management uh, to be well informed about the risks. And so this is the way uh, that we see uh, the, the, the top-down approach that we see for the deployment. And there are, of course, advantages and disadvantages of this uh, approach. So the advantage, well, some of the advantages uh, is that we have a very clear integration with existing systems and workflows. So you see that it's very easy to, to visualize it because there, there are clear paths, the clear connections between the different systems uh, and the current workflows. We have a controlled interpretation of the emerging uh, risks. So we have the validation of the risks. So you are controlling and you know what is going uh, and what is uh, communicated to the management. And there is also clear accountability for the reporting and it's usually following the reporting workflow that the company already has. But uh, of, of course, there are also disadvantages. Uh, so one of, uh, of uh, the disadvantages that we see is that not all the levels of the business are covered. There is a single point uh, of failure in case a, a super user or a core team is doing this kind of uh, validation or this kind of uh, communication. And uh, usually a new role and some new steps in the, in the current process, in the existing process, need to be introduced. So there is a change management process, but it's quite control. Huh? It's still quite control. So this was the, the first scenario, the first deployment scenario. The second deployment scenario has a bottom-up uh, philosophy. So the idea here is to integrate the emerging risk information at the key levels of the organization, having QA and food safety teams at different levels to use the intelligence uh, solution and to be able to improve the monitoring and uh, the risk monitoring, the risk assessment and the, the risk prevention approach that uh, uh, they are doing. So again, if we would like to visualize how uh, this deployment approach looks like, so we have the new solution, the risk intelligence solution being used both uh, at a global level, but also at the regional level uh, by different business units or, or operating units. Uh, so at the global level, uh, there are some specific uh, scenarios, uh, some specific operations that are uh, used uh, uh, in, 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 in which the system is used. Uh, and uh, also at the regional level, the experts are using the system in a different way, following different use cases, and also looking at some cases at a different uh, uh, set of suppliers, different set of ingredients that are relevant for the specific region. Which are the advantages of uh, such a bottom-up approach is that uh, in this way, we can involve more uh, key, we can involve all the key business levels but also more teams uh, uh, which can be empowered with emerging risk information. Uh, we have a fast dissemination of emerging risks, avoiding also the single point of failure that we mentioned in the top-down approach. 
So uh, very in a very fast way, the risk, the emerging risk information is communicated uh, not only centrally, but also at a regional level. And there is also an alignment of the, of the key teams regarding the emerging risk, which can speed, uh, which can speed up the decision-making process. Of course, all the goods are coming with some disadvantages as well here. So the change management process is a bit um, more, is, we can say it's more important here. Uh, so it should be carefully managed because there are more, pe more people uh, that need to be involved. More people need to be trained. Uh, there are new responsibilities uh, for existing roles uh, that they need, the, the people need to adopt. So the change in terms of the people uh, and the experts is something that needs to be done in a, a very serious and careful way. The third scenario that I have already introduced at the beginning of uh, uh, this, this part of this presentation is that uh, there is a combination, we see also a combination of uh, the top-down and the bottom-up approach, which is a more end-to-end -end deployment uh, option. Uh, by end-to-end, -end, I mean end-to-end -end in the supply chain. So uh, we see that we have, uh, in this scenario, we have the teams at the global level using the uh, solution. Uh, the digital solution. We have also the teams at the regional level, but also manufacturer partners and suppliers uh, adopt uh, the information, the, the digital solution locally. So this is this is the main add-on here. And uh, again, if we want to illustrate it and to visualize this uh, this specific de deployment scenario, we have the digital solution being adopted at the different levels. And the new level here is the local level where the suppliers or the manufacturing partners can uh, use such a solution to have real-time monitoring of the risks for the materials and the, the ingredients that they are using. Uh, but also there is a, uh, there can, there can be a, a good collaboration can be established between uh, the company and uh, the organizations, uh, the suppliers and the partners that are located at the upstream of the supply chain. So the, again here, the advantages that we see is that is, uh, it's uh, quite similar. The, the set of advantages is quite similar to uh, the ones that we had in the bottom up. What I would like to point out here is that uh, engaging the regional operating units uh, can help us to ensure that a risk will be identified timely at the upstream and not only at the process in the downstream of the supply chain. Uh, again, here we have some disadvantages. Uh, still, there's still a, a change management process that we need to carefully manage. Uh, we need to make changes in the roles uh, in the, by adding responsibilities and there are many people that need to be trained in the new solution, in the way, in the new way of identifying and reporting risks and preventing risks. Uh, and of course, the very important advantage of engaging the regional, the, the local level of suppliers and uh, partners comes also with uh, the disadvantage that uh, still some energy, some important amount of energy is needed to convince uh, the uh, suppliers and partners to adopt the solution. And here I want to make it uh, more, uh, I want to emphasize a bit in this scenario, uh, which are the benefits of engaging the suppliers and the partners uh, that we see. Uh, one, one very important benefit is that uh, they are using the same solution so you can have a homogeneous way risk prevention approach, way of approaching the risk. The second thing that I would like to highlight is that when 
this level, this local level, this upstream level is involved, uh, we can have an improved collaboration with uh, the stakeholders at this level, but sh by sharing risk reports and predictions. And uh, a, a very important thing is that uh, we can ensure that preventive measures start at the upstream, so uh, we have a more timely uh, activation of the preventive measures uh, that can help us to become more proactive. Independently on the deployment scenarios, uh, since I, I started with the new requirements, so I would like to make clear uh, that uh, independently, independently of the deployment scenarios, uh, the food uh, companies, by adopting such a solution, uh, can comply with the new requirements. So this is something that uh, yeah, uh, we see that it's important to do. Uh, and uh, by adopting such a solution, we can comply with the hazards analysis uh, requirements that we see in the new regulations, uh, with the vulnerability assessment requirements uh, that we see uh, uh, coming from the GFSI food safety recognized schemas. Uh, and uh, also we can, uh, the companies can comply to the foreign supplier verification program rule uh, by evaluating uh, the supplier's uh, history of compliance uh, with uh, according to the regulations and by knowing all the uh, previous food safety history of this supply of these uh, suppliers and these companies that we are they are working with so there are i would like to to finish my part by saying that there are many points from which we can start the journey of uh, uh, the di digital transformation. Eh? Uh, and the, and the, at the end of the day, it's uh, about improving the risk prevention approach uh, that we have. And we need to take into account uh, not only the systems, but also the people and the processes that needs to uh, be changed and the people that will adopt and the experts that will adopt uh, and how we can empower them uh, with such solutions. So I have five points that I can share uh, as a um, suggestion of how such a uh, journey can be started. So the first point is that it's very important to start with the a return of investment uh, in mind, uh, which will help you very much to quantify the benefits, to, to have a clarity on, uh, to clarify which are the goals and uh, to get the budget, uh, sign of the budget approval. Eh? So this is starting uh, through, uh, starting with Roy is a very important part. The second thing is that it's good to have a more long-term uh, view and decide upon a, a clear uh, three to five years model and have a plan for this model. Uh, and this uh, includes also the decision if something should be implemented in-house or uh, a third-party solution uh, should be uh, adopted. Eh? The third thing is that uh, we would recommend avoid being too technology driven, that uh, AI can solve everything, big data can solve everything, uh, but also that we need to have a balance there uh, because we don't need to be also too technology skeptical that all these things are marketing buzzwords, we will build our own. So there is always a trade-off. Eh? We need to, to have a balance there. Uh, the third thing is, the fourth thing is that uh, uh, try to be lean uh, and uh, uh, follow an agile approach, an iterative approach in the execution. And the last thing is that uh, we need, it's, it's very good always to keep our eyes on the target. Uh, there are points in this journey that we need to rethink uh, strategically where we are, what we want to achieve. 
Uh, and it's very important to have in this journey all the leaders with us. Eh? But also, ideally, we would like, it would be great also to uh, engage external partners. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Yanis, and we'll get back to you with questions. Uh, I would like to ask the audience to start, even if they want now, uh, putting some questions in uh, in the chat. I will I will collect them and uh, have a Q and A session at the end of the webinar. Colin, that's the that's the external expert experience or advice. Eh? But you've been there, you've done that, you have suffered throughout the journey. So we we are really looking forward to. To your experience and your uh, what you have to share with our audience. Great, uh, thanks, Nikos. Appreciate that. Um, yes, I've been there, suffered, and, and have the war wounds to prove it. Um, I'm just trying to move down the page. And um, okay, so yeah, so so what's what's my experience? So I, I had a, a ten year journey with with a big corporation I, at Nestle of implementing. Uh, systems, digital transformation, and uh, I lived and breathed that for over a decade. Just wanted to go through some of my experience. Um, the challenge number one is, is, is when you have a, a big corporation, and you're deploying common systems, common platforms across the organization, it's, it starts with a, a global design. And that's where I started off in Switzerland for over a year, designing a, a template. And part of that, I think there's three key principles that, that come with looking at this. Uh, Giannis mentioned there is a, a, a global and a regional approach. And this is how um, my organization that I was working for at the time adopted that. The three principles, and, and try and keep this in mind, they're still very valid today. Processes and process mapping. Um, you have to understand your processes. You don't go straight in and start uh, putting um, uh, technology into an organization. If you haven't fully defined your process, it won't work. The second one is data standards. You have to start understanding that um, organizations have grown over time and, and have their own data standards, typically country by country. And then that has to change. You have to get to new uh, naming conventions for various different things, um, objects and, and data uh, objects in your organization. So that's what's a material number, what, what's a process order number look like and, and so on. That is really, really important. Um, and with the data standards, actually brings a common vocabulary. Um, some organizations may have called it a, a shop floor order. Uh, and uh, these things have to become common vocabulary, which is key. And then finally, that the business excellence piece comes in is where business um, professionals will come in and define the best practices. So if there's a best way of doing something in a particular market, how do you deploy that globally? And, and how do you get buy-in to do that? Well, as I mentioned, that, that leads me nicely into senior leadership buy-in. Um, if you don't have a sponsor, uh, at the top of the organization, digital transformation will likely fail. If it's seen as a bunch of technical guys coming in to update your systems, it will likely fail. So the head of the organization has to take that leadership sponsorship type role. Then you have proof of concept. You have to test the hypothesis. You've created this template. Does it actually work? So you, you pick a market or two, you go in there and apply that template design to see whether it fits. If it fits, great, you've tested the hypothesis, you can, you can roll this out globally. So these are the kind, the kind of um, uh, processes to do that. Then you can go into the implementation phase. Um, and then for me, that's where I moved from Switzerland to Australia. And I worked regionally then in Asia, Oceania and Africa implementing the system that was that was globally designed. Um, and uh, I can't go into all the fun of go lives. Um, I have a few war wounds, a few good stories, a few horror stories, but if anyone's interested, uh, let me know and we can uh, have a discussion all about go lives. So then challenge number two, oh, for, first of all, the, the process framework, here's a quick diagram for this. What I mean by pro mapping your processes. Um, if you're not familiar with this, is, is understanding process levels. Uh, what are the very high level processes and what are the lower level processes? And when you can align processes to procedures and understand what goes where and fully define the why, the what, the how, this is when you really start understanding how to deploy systems. There's a whole philosophy behind this. If you don't know it, happy to discuss. 
with you guys, anyone wants to drop me an email. And then challenge number two um, is basically once you have the system implemented, you really have to understand, does it really align with the corporate procedures and global instructions? The reality is these uh, implementations are fast paced. They, they, re they require a lot of resource. Those resources are finite. So sometimes the speed of the deployment doesn't always go with the speed of alignment. So after my stint down in Australia and working in Asia and Africa, I came back to Switzerland to spend a lot of time in a global role. Now my position has changed. I was the global head of, of, of an ISIT systems for quality food safety, working with our corporate folks to really align against corporate procedures, corporate instructions. Um, and that is quite a challenge because you have a lot of um, moments where there is not alignment and, and that needs to be addressed. In addition to that, you start saying, okay, we have a global system in. Now we need to start either um, uh, leg legacy systems, creating legacy systems, basically archiving old systems, or defining what needs to stay in the system landscape. So legacy versus heritage. This can be an interesting discussion. And there's a lot of people that will fight against their system being archived and being decommissioned. So there's a lot of uh, 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 discussions and a lot of debate. People will not always give up their systems. They become their babies. And we, we have to understand that there's a people side of that um, as well to manage. But ultimately, why are we decommissioning systems? Well, it's ultimately reducing co complexity for big organizations that reduces cost. And, and ultimately you'll get into the goal of, in this case, digitizing food safety. Um, and if there's too much complexity, you can overburden your organization. So in addition to that, then new systems providers will come in and offer plug and play systems off the shelf. I always say be wary of that because it comes back to my, my first challenge is understand your processes, understand your best practices, understand your business before you, you adopt a system. And it's not always plug and play. It needs a lot of understanding, not just configuration, but ultimately, how does that um, work with your business? Then, then manage your priorities. Um, there is a whole whirlwind when you're doing a global transformation project. They, everything seems to be a priority. So you have to have the breathing space to step, sit back, work with the corporate business to understand what is a priority, what is not a priority. And once you have defined and, uh, and mapped out your priorities, stay focused. Um, there'll be a lot of distractions depending on what's happening um, around the world. Very importantly, look at roles and responsibilities. Roles and responsibilities uh, may, may change. As you put in systems, historically, um, one function may have worked on a, a certain task. That could change when you understand best practice that becomes really important. Otherwise, you become very siloed managed. Within quality, within food safety, it can often be uh, a dumping ground for roles and responsibilities. If quality is in the title, it tends to be run by the quality department when it's not always the case. It's not always the case. It could be operations, it could be engineering, it could be uh, um, procurement and so on. So be wary of that. And then the final watch out is don't over configure the system. If you um, create custom development, if you create bespoke development, you have to manage that forever. So, so really you are looking for a, an, a system that you can work with, but you don't have to over configure. If people are saying the system needs to be over configured, go back to the business processes. Not easy, but that's the way, um, that's the only way you're going to do it. You will learn the hard way otherwise if you over configure. And then, then challenge number three. So I said I started off in a regional, I started off in a Switzerland role, looking after the template, the regional role down in Australia, back to Switzerland. And then challenge number three was back in a regional role in the Americas. So in, in this role is once the systems have been deployed, once you have alignment with, with global instructions, corporate procedures, um, the implementation's done, the glow live is, is done, but then what does that really mean? How do you sustain the system? A lot of energy goes into getting what people believe is over the finish line with the system implemented. But if it's left unattended over time, then the system will not deliver. You can actually have problems with that system if it's poorly maintained. So there, there is the challenge there is how do we sustain the system? And in that respect, how do we have the right people doing the right tasks? 
how do we, if we over configure, um, how do we have a lot of technical resource to keep on top of that? Um, and, and the locks of, and the checks and balances that come with, with sustaining the system. And that, that is really, really key. And then ultimately, once you have the sustain in place, then, then the critical thing is leverage the system. It, it's all of a sudden, a big organization that historically had thousands and thousands of different systems that didn't talk to each other, all of a sudden has one massive ERP system, in this case, SAP, with one standardized set of data that has the same numbering and the same data standards. And all of a sudden you can get a lot of uh, perspective on what food safety means and what other things mean that, that's important for an organization. So for me to be part of the sustain and leverage was really the, 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 the completing the journey for me. And I had the pleasure to do that in North and South America, going to a lot of markets and helping them understand one, how to make sure they maintain it and one, how they really get that um, return on investment. Uh, and all of a sudden you are working with integrated systems. And it's fascinating because again, as I said before, there's thousands of different systems run by different functions that didn't talk to each other. Now you've got common data sets and you've got a common system where especially in the technical area, you're looking at operations folk talking more with quality folk, talking more with engineering uh, and so on and pulling data at a very fast speed to make decisions. So you start uh, being able to make global decisions based on data where historically you may have to send out requests, try and aggregate that data, try and understand it. And that is almost an impossible task. So the return on investment starts coming when you understand understanding the, the data and the connectivity that you have in your organization. The key points there is sustaining the system the business needs to be convinced. They've seen this huge investment. They've seen uh, a lot of talk from the head of the organization who's the sponsor. A lot of these business excellence guys coming in and saying this system's gonna transform your business. And when sometimes it doesn't work very well, the business is not convinced. So the first thing is get them convinced. Um, and when they have confidence in the system, the leverage piece is getting the business excited. And, and literally, you will have these aha moments when a senior leader comes into a meeting and says, you know what, I have a very, very strong picture of compliance in my organization today because I can extract it from the system. I can extract data to give me a higher confidence level. Then all of a sudden, the business says, really? Yes. Uh, and that, and one example being with things like ERP systems, you can create health checks. And health checks in terms of food safety compliance is, is anything from, have I consumed an expired material? Do I have enough operators on a production line? Do I have the right authority for release uh, of finished products? Do we have um, uh, the, uh, what, what is our number one problem within cost of non-quality? Uh, these are the kind of our home, our, our home moments comes out of these health checks. And then you can even get organizations then benchmarking themselves regionally, one market comparing themselves to another market. You get senior leaders just looking at comparison data like that, they get very competitive and that drives improvement. So again, um, the getting the business excited is at the end of the journey. Are they excited at the beginning of the journey? No, not always, but when they see the output, um, it can be uh, quite a transformational change. But in my case, it, it, it's a long journey. It takes around 10 years to, to achieve that. Uh, one key point I just wanted to touch upon here is, is um, after my journey implementing uh, systems for digital transformation for quality food safety uh, and, and working with the corporate folk on global instructions, on global procedures and policy, I got fascinated by the, the concept of the management systems. The management systems are examples like ISO 22000. So in food safety, that could be SQF or BRC or IFS, for example, these GFSI recognized schemes. Now that, that's really important because then that, how does that play nicely with the data, the digital transformation uh, that comes out? And ultimately I go back to silo managed uh, uh, approaches. Business excellence people are so focused on the digital transformation and best practices that that's their wheelhouse. But then you get on the other side of the fence, 
systems managers implementing things like ISO 22000, ISO 9001, a quality management system. You go beyond uh, food safety and you start looking at environmental management systems, occupational health and safety. But the key point is, is they, they play so well together, but people don't understand how they connect. I, I've, I've had the privilege of working on a 10 year digital transformation journey and, and a privilege of working 10 years in management systems. So, so really that, that's been my journey. I don't, I don't encourage everyone to do that. It's quite a, a transformation just personally to be able to do it. But the key thing is to encourage if you are a digital transformation expert in your organization, start speaking to your systems managers, start understanding how, how management systems work. And again, if you're a management systems expert in your organization implementing these food safety systems, start talking to your digital guys and seeing how data can actually transform your role to drive compliance. And I believe auditing will change because of the data side of things. So then just to, to summarize, um, my journey with, with management systems, with ISIT systems and, and, and um, digital transformation, uh, four tips of advice, and I, I stick by these principles today, and, and I often think about them. First one is, is people, protect your people. Now, we've talked probably for the last 45 minutes about digital and transformation and systems and process, but none of that's possible. Um, we, we're not advanced enough where everything is automated by computers and robots. It's people that are doing these tasks. So, so when you are doing these digital transformation uh, projects, understand the people, understand who are the, who are the people that are going to be doing this work, support them. Um, it's, it's no surprise that people will tell you stories of doing 20 hour days and, and, and these kind of things. And ultimately that, that's your number one asset um, with digital transformation, with compliance. It really is, I honestly believe that. The second thing is, is eliminate uh, and challenge manual processes. Um, I, I sniff manual processes out and poor, poor processes probably by instinct now because I've been doing it for 20 years. And, and I'm a painful guy because when I see it, I raise it and I say, this is just like crazy. How long has this been going on? And typically the answer is, oh, it's been going on for 20 years, Colin. You're never going to change it. Uh, and it's just the way it is. And this is the way it was put in. And I'll go back to that point is saying it takes a minute to establish a bad process, but a lifetime to reverse it, to go through the change management of fixing a bad process to get stakeholder buy in. And people will always say they're too busy for that initiative. So, so keep that in mind. The, the, the planning of establishing processes you really have to understand what that is going to do. If there's going to be any, any un, unintended consequences, otherwise you have a lifetime of pain with that process. Uh, the next one, um, we've talked a little bit about standards. We talked a, bit, a little bit about process. Um, organizations can be overly prescriptive in standards. Uh, scheme owners can be overly prescriptive in standards. And ultimately, that makes it very, very difficult for organizations to implement and sustain. Um, and, also, and also, it can create a lot of compliance problems as well, because you have to maintain and adhere to those standards. Things are moving way too quick to have 50-page um, procedures today. No one reads them. Um, and, and ultimately, if you're overly prescriptive in there, you will, as an auditor, you will get found out very quickly. You'll have non-conformities, um, a many. The, the advice I give you today is all about est establishing simple rules. Simplify the procedures. Make sure that there you, we need pre procedures, policy, and so on. But make sure that there are simple rules that are adaptable to risk uh, and the rapid speed of change. Um, very quickly, you'll have a set of procedures that will be like uh, the Britannica Encyclopedia that will be no longer relevant when the internet took off and these guys are trying to knock on people's doors and sell encyclopedias. That's what can happen to your organization as a watch out. And then finally, last but not least, is never sit still. Um, if you rest on your laurels um, and you think, hey, I've mastered it, I've mastered my system, um, if you sit still for too long, you uh, the, the world will change around you. So as, as, a, as an example for me, I, I learned SAP, I implemented SAP, I went on a 10 year journey implementing that, but I was motivated then to move into management systems. I'm not telling everyone to do that, but that was my example of not sitting still. We see now that, that many other 
um, uh, experts in SAP and maybe getting over uh, overtaken by salesforce.com and, and all these other cloud-based platforms. So um, that's the key thing as well is, is be aware of that. And, and then ultimately partner with technology partners that understand that their, their technology needs to evolve as well. So um, it's nothing worse than putting a system in and that system becoming obsolete or becoming a legacy system without providing that return on investment. So as I say, never sit still, keep moving forward. Uh, it's a fast paced industry. If you choose digital transformation, it's a, it's a really fun ride. It really is. But it also means you never stop learning. Thank you very much. That's, that's a positive uh, sense uh, and flavor. I, I want to keep this uh, positive spirit. And I have a couple of questions. I will not ask all the questions that I have uh, collected, but there is one that I really want to ask you, both of you, and it has to do with silos. I was having the conversation with one of our clients uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, they were telling me, we really want to put this uh, digital transformation uh, project in place. But our people are very slow when it comes to talking to each other. So there are department silos. R&D doesn't speak very easily. Uh, to quality. Aren't these understaffed and they're very, very busy. And then quality doesn't speak uh, very often with uh, procurement because procurement is focusing on uh, very critical things and doesn't have time for this kind of uh, interactions. Colin, I want to ask you, how did you manage to overcome these obstacles? Yeah, it's it's a good question. It's uh, to overcome. Give me a, a brief answer. Eh? Yeah. To, to overcome, it's not, not so easy. A few things is you, you need cross-functional thinkers. You need systems thinkers to be able to connect the dots. Um, so, so you need people that are willing to learn a little bit about everything across your value chain. Uh, th those are key players. You can't have everyone in your, in your organization to do that, but identify those key players and encourage them to connect the dots. Um, just simple things like open plan seeding in organizations, pulling down the walls. Uh, if you're in a corridor and, and uh, the procurement guys are in one room and the quality guys are in another room, they won't talk. You pull down the doors um, and literally people start talking. Um, and ultimately systems that are integrated actually forces people to, to have those conversations. So integration, people being in the same proximity and, and identifying your, your systems thinkers and encouraging them to connect the dots. Okay. Thank you. When it comes to, to systems integration, there is something very hidden behind data integration, Yanis. Uh, the data silos part, either the internal data silos or when you're trying to connect internal data to external data. Is there something else that we shouldn't forget? Is there a critical component there that helps connect these different worlds? Yeah, so what we see is that I will uh, share three three levels that I see this, this uh, silos. The first level is even internally. Uh, Colin shared some examples, but even internally in the company, uh, due to the fact that many different terminologies are used by different departments or different systems the data remain disconnected so the, you can you cannot use you cannot link the, the different data that you have internally so this is the one level the second level is uh, when you you are trying to connect other systems or external data so again there are you have very similar challenges. You cannot connect them. You have silos. You have different terminologies being used, uh, different formats of data being used. So this is another another thing. And if we want to go to the third level, which is the ideal of how we can build public-private uh, data trusts, uh, data banks that are trusted and secure, you have also uh, the difficulty of connecting different formats, connecting different uh, types of data, uh, but also you have there uh, the security things, the data protection uh, important issue. So 
what we have seen is that the answer to eliminate the data silos is to adopt uh, data standards. Data standards which can start from the schemas of the data that we are using, of how we are describing the key entities uh, in the food safety landscape, uh, but also standards even in terms of how we classify our foods, how we classify the hazards. So if we want to eliminate this, we need to go towards to data standards. What I hear you describing is actually developing components of a data infrastructure. Not to forget that there is a data infrastructure piece that has to be built. And uh, this makes me wonder what kind of people we need in the organization or complementing the in-house capabilities to develop this kind of, uh, of uh, components. Any quick thoughts or suggestions or good practices before I wrap up? What kind of people do we need? For the data piece and then the AI piece? I, I will share uh, quickly some thoughts and Colin, you can compliment her. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in a data, in a world uh, that uh, is based on the information, where the, the, the information is very critical, uh, it's, it's necessary to have people that also understand data, that can process the data. So uh, the, the basic uh, thing that we should establish is that we should also internally have people that uh, they can uh, do the main things, the main stuff of the data engineering, of the data processing, data analysis. So this is something that uh, needs to be integrated. And we see that the companies are already adopting uh, this approach. So they have, and uh, mainly the analysis, the data analysis is uh, very important. Uh, the data engineering has is a, a complex, is something very specific. So. Uh, it's not necessary to have a very large data engineering team. Uh, data engineers, data analysts. Data analysts, data scientists, if you want to, to go towards the predictive analytics part and uh, uh, in general, if you want to integrate analytics for risk. So what these are the think? three categories that I see. Okay. Well, what do you think? Uh, just this... very quickly, a, a data person can be a bridge builder. So what we've seen before is, I mentioned before, a corporate function, looking at uh, business processes uh, and policy, and you see a, an IASIT division looking after systems, right? And, and historically, maybe the corporate system said, I need this data. The, the, the ISIT guys never fully understood what the problem statement is. You create a, a data set and it doesn't quite deliver. What that integration has to happen now is now some of these corporate functions are hiring a data specialist in their team that understands the, their function. So in food safety, it's typically a junior person that may not be qualified to sit in a corporate function, but what they bring, they bring all that data expertise. So it's not a request for another function. It's actually being part of that, uh, that, that corporate group to be able to really uh, translate that and then they're the bridge builder to the guys that actually made main meal build that data set so that that's that's the key thing i see the same thing in, in auditing as well is today we have management systems and auditors will be 30 years experience uh, but they will be over time i believe complemented by more junior auditors but that junior auditor will come in with a, a data capability to be able to, to to data mine and understand how to get data out and to draw conclusions from that data so that, that's where um, any young person that's coming through with that, that, that skill set, it won't be, you won't be sitting in, a, in an ISIT function. You will be sitting in business roles. Um, and I think that's the important thing that they, uh, anyone who learns the business and understands systems is going to be the bridge builder. Mm, so yeah, I hear you describing not only different skill sets and uh, functions and profiles, but also different perspectives and uh, different uh, sets of eyes. Huh? Correct. Uh, yes. I think it, it boils down to the essential, ultimate question that I wanted to, to to ask you, or ask everyone to reflect upon. I don't think that we have an answer here, but uh, what you're describing is building a, some kind of technology organization. 
within the organization. So do we see a transformation of food companies into technology companies or do we see parts of these uh, organizations that have been manufacturing and distributing food into also becoming uh, the technology, data, and AI uh, engines of uh, such an organization? That's that's a good question to keep in mind. Huh? And then I also want to highlight that I think the, the, the greatest pitfall of them all, I think that's the trap in which people like me and Yanis, who have been in technology for many, many years, have been falling again and again, focusing too much on tech and what sounds fancy and uh, interesting and new uh, can distract people from the real thing. And the real thing is supporting the business critical decisions, becoming more efficient and more evidence-based and data-based rather than uh, being relied, relying upon the expertise and the experience of, uh, of human experts only. Yeah? And I think I heard you both describing this mentality of being uh, iterative, of working in an agile mode, being able to learn faster by failing uh, faster doing experiments, doing pilots, trying things, design things process-wise, then go down to implementation, and then go back again to processes so that the cycle of, of uh, learning and evolution can become uh, quicker. And this is a, a different mindset and a challenging mindset in uh, large organizations. So I want to thank you uh, for sharing this experience. We, we have been sharing a bit of advice in one of the white papers that we have uh, authored in, uh, in the past. So I'm inviting everyone that hasn't read it to download it and read it. And I think that I can convince you guys to contribute to a new one that uh, will be documenting all the experience that you have shared today with us so that we can also make it available and people can download it. And they can also come to you to ask more questions. Let me thank everyone that joined the webinar today. I hope that you found value in it and uh, stories of success, but also stories of, of failure. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day or have a nice evening. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you so much. Thank you.